שבוע טוב, חודש טוב, חג שמח, everything we have together today, ראש חודש, חנוכה, and no week, and it's פרשת ויגש, one פרשה before the end of בראשית, of Genesis. So what's so special about this פרשה, because it is very special. It gives us, <coughs> again, this is the time of חנוכה, so it is the time of talking about miracles. And what does it mean, a miracle? So here it is, the story itself. We are reading in the book of Genesis, chapter 44, verse 18. Now, whoever does not remember, in the previous parasha, in the previous chapter, Joseph is becoming king of Egypt, thanks to all uh, the miracles that he went through. And then he is being appointed by the king of Egypt, by Pharaoh, becomes the, the ruler of Egypt, and he makes Egypt the greatest empire ever. Egypt reaches its uh, peak of its power. And then the brothers are coming. Now, Joseph knows they are coming because he knows there's going to be famine. So he puts some, uh, uh, he makes sure that the brothers are being brought before him. He plays it like he doesn't know them, that he's Egyptian, that he doesn't know Hebrew. And there's a whole story. And finally, in the end of the parasha, of parashat uh, Miketz, that's last week's parasha, Joseph is sending them back home and he leaves Shimon, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, he leaves him in jail, in prison, in Egypt. And then he says, you want to see your brother, you have to bring your smaller brother, Benjamin, Benjamin with you. Of course, Jacob does not want to send his son, he's afraid of it, so they delay, Finally, they need to eat, so they go with Benjamin to Egypt. They come in front of Joseph. Joseph is very nice to them. He's releasing Shimon. He's sending them back home, and then the most terrible thing happens, which is they plant the goblet, the silver goblet of Joseph in Benjamin's bag. When this is being found, now they come back to Joseph, and Joseph says, the one who is the thief will stay as a slave to me, and you guys can go home. But they promised. They promised Jacob, if they don't come home with, with uh, Benjamin, that's, they know, it's like the end. The, fall, the family is falling apart. Rachel had two sons. They sold Joseph to be a slave, who knows if he's alive, and now Benjamin is gone. It's like he's facing this horrible, dire future. Everything becomes bleak, and the screen is dark now because it's the end of Parashat Vaigash. Now, uh, Parashat Miketz, last week's parasha. This week's parasha is how they face it, and it says, Vaigash elav Yehuda vayomer. Yehuda approaches to Joseph and he says, you know, you read, it's the, again, Genesis 44, uh, verse 18, and he says, you know, I want to talk to you, if you don't mind, as your slave, we are your slave. He's very kind of, a, he's talking to this great ruler. Remember, this is 4,000 years ago. Joseph could kill them just in a blink. No UN, you know, forget about them. Anyway, but uh, who cares about them? Who cares about them? They have no rights whatsoever. They're foreigners in Egypt. It's like, who's going to protect them? They're finished. They have no, there's no, and the guy, he can, they have no idea what his reaction is going to be. They have no idea what his plans. Maybe he takes Benjamin and he's going to kill all of them. You have no idea. You know, ancient Rulers were like, like today dictators. When you get too much, too much power and no checks and balances, it's over with. It's like you can do any craziness possible. Now, he's telling Joseph, please, you know, you ask us about the father, about the brother. We are, we're not spies. Like, what, why is this happening? We cannot go back to our father without, without, without Benjamin. He'll die. Why should Joseph care about it? So, why 
is this story over here. Is this, is this kind of gossip about Yehuda, about Joseph? No, we are talking about the Bible. The Bible is the book of all technology of this universe. You want to know how this universe works, you read the Bible. It's all codified. So some people, not smart enough, they see the stories, like, you know, the first famous uh, soap opera, telenovela, whatever you want to call it, drama, family drama of dysfunctional family. That's how you want to see it. It won't survive so many years. The story is very deep, and the Zohar is giving us the, uh, the real story behind it. So the Zohar for this parasha starts, I'm starting with the beginning of the Zohar Perusha Sulam, the commentary on the Zohar. And it says, Vayiga shel av Yehuda. Rabbi Elazar patach v'amar. Rabbi Elazar is quoting, as usually, in the beginning of the parasha, quoting a verse from Isaiah, chapter 63. Ki ata avinu, ki avam lo yada'anu, v'yisrael yu akirenu. Because you, the Lord, you are our father, and Abraham doesn't know us, and Israel will not uh, recognize us. Ata Hashem avinu goaleinu. You are the Lord, you are our Father, you are our Redeemer. Meolam shemecha. Your name is forever. Simplistic explanation. Hai kao kumoa, there are many, many commentaries, says the Zohar to this, um, uh, to this verse. We already explained it. Aval tachazi, come and see. When the Creator created this world, every day in the six days of creation, there was a creation of itself. But when the day, when the sixth day has come, it was time to create you. The legend says the Torah came in front of God. And said, I'm warning you. I'm warning you. This man, this human that you're going to create, are going to get you angry, get upset. If you're not going to be patient, you better don't create, you're not creating else. So the Creator said to the Torah, is that for nothing that I'm being created, Erech Hapayim, the Lord of Patience? Okay, was that story? Which means the Torah spoke to Adam. What is the Torah? Is that an entity? It's a book? There were no books yet. So we are talking about, it's, it's a frequency. Now, Ela, Kola Beoraitet Berei. We have to understand, everything was created by the Torah. The Torah has all the secrets of the creation in the Torah. And that's also part of the secrets. And there's a legend that says that everything not just was created by the Torah, but it was created before the Torah. There were the 22 Hebrew letters. Okay, and the same way the Torah starts with the letter Bet, so the world was created with the letter Bet. Now, <clears throat> says the Zohar, so Rabbi Ashlag explained, Before the Creator created the world, which is Nukba, which is female. And we have to understand, according to the Zohar, this world is female. The creation is female as we spoke about it in the last previous week, and the creator is male. The creator is the donor. He's giving the life force to every, everything, from a little atom till big creatures. All, all of them get the sustenance and life force from the creator. So the donor is the male, and the recipient is the female. This is the language, okay? Which means, we are all females, right? Even the ones who create, who consider themselves to be men, they are females, right? They are kind of a little, at females, we kind of, of masculine thing. 
but they're females. Why? Because you need the light of the Creator to survive. Without the light of the Creator, you cannot live. You cannot exist even one split second. That need is called female, right? Because you can't live without that light of the Creator. Now, but then there's another story. The story is very much detailed in the entrance to the Zohar, in the introduction to the Zohar. It's called Ma'amara Otiyot, the essay of the letters of Rabbi Himnun Saba. Okay? But here there's a condensed version, very, very condensed version, because the original article, it takes few months to study. Okay. And it says, before the world was created, before the female, which means the female aspect of the creation that appeared, there were the letters. And all the letters came in front of God, so the legend says, and backwards, which means from Taf to Aleph. Why from Taf to Aleph? Because female, when you read the Hebrew letters, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, the Hebrew alphabet, you read them from Aleph, Bet, all the way till Taf. Why? Because when the light is coming from above to below, that's the order. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet. But when it's coming from the vessel, from the creation, it goes backwards, Taf, Shin, Reish, Kuf. Okay? This is also why we celebrate Rosh Hashanah in Tishrei, although it is the seventh month. Because the month of the spring, which is Nisan, okay, Aries, is called Aviv. Aviv starts with Aleph Bet, because on the month of the spring and summer, there's a lot of positive energy, energy that descends from above, and that's why it starts with Aleph Bet. Now, this is coming from the Creator. Now, from us, the time, the season, for our season is starting from fall and winter. That's why it's Tishrei, Taf, Shin, Reish, the last letter, second from the last, third from the last. So that's why we, our Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah is in Tishrei, because we are the vessel. So the vessel time is on Tishrei. So just, so when we're talking about the letters are, which are the vessels, and so we see them from below to above, from Taf all the way. So that's how the legend says, first came the letter Tav and said in front of God, you should create the world with me. Amal HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God said, no, you can't. Ki bach, at yedim arbet tzadigim lamut. Because Tav is the last letter, it says in the Zohar, that 30 days before somebody dies, the letter Tav appears on his forehead or her forehead. Tav means it's the end, game over. Since that, because also righteous people also will have that Tav on their forehead before they die. So because the letter Tav symbolizes the end of the road, okay? Okay, so I'll just skip a little bit because this is long. The letter Tav could not create the world. Okay, so came the letters Shin and Kuf and Reish by order, descending, uh, ascending order from Tav upwards. Okay, and they were said, they were told you cannot create the world also because you are the letters of Sheker. Sheker means a lie. Okay, so the same words all the way, all the way up through the letters till came the letter Bet. And when the letter Bet came, and the letter Bet symbolized bracha, blessing. So the world was created by the letter Bet. That's why the Torah starts with the letter Bet of Bereshit Bara Elohim. And why? Because the letter Bet is a symbol for blessing. And what I mean blessing? If the world is based and built on blessing, it means there's no dark side. It's going to be walking. When something is, has bliss, something is blessed. So that's why this world has only one future, which is good. 
which means we learn that if <clears throat> and is well, it means that all is well, and if it's not well, it's not the end, which means there's another chapter, another chapter, till finally it's going to be well. When it's good, then it means game over, okay, completed. And we have to understand that, that there's nothing else by, but that. Just everything was created for the good because the world is based on the letter bet. Okay? Another reason why the letter bet, because the letter bet blessing is only positive. Okay? Now, how the letter bet is written, you have a roof and you have a bottom. This is the heaven and this is the earth. And there's a valve connecting between the top line and the bottom line. That's our job. Our job as human is to connect the heaven to the earth. And we connect the heaven to the earth and we unite the world and the bliss can flow. So then we can manifest our calling, which is to be creatures of magic, creatures who learn as we learn in the previous parasha, to bring the magic down to earth, to bring the light down to every action. There are no stem or no meaningless actions, according to the, the Torah. No meaningless action. Every action, you have to look at it as an opportunity to bring bliss to the world. Could be baking a cake, making supper. It could be sending greetings to somebody. It doesn't matter. Everything you do, if you have that concentration to inject bliss in whatever you do, you will feel that your life is meaningful and you will feel that every moment of your life is not wasted. Now, that is a story. So we learn from that one thing, that this world, and we are part of this world, is the female. The creation is the female, and the purpose of the female is to be a recipient for the, for the light of the Creator. We have no other purpose, no other purpose, okay? It's all about the light and receiving the light. But we have a little problem. We learn if you receive the light just for yourself, you've been cursed because you explode, because you become the end. It burns you. The only way the light can dwell into the vessel is when the vessel shares, when the vessel becomes from end, selfish, and to endless. When you don't become the last station of the flow, because the light, when it's the last station, when it's an end, it's, it disappears, it goes. You bring it to others. You give it this a desire to receive for the sake of sharing. Now, and that's why he brings that verse that we read before from Isaiah, chapter 63. And it says, Ata Avinu. Ata. Now, Ata is being translated to you. Right? But not exactly. The Zohar explains that the word Ata is divided into two parts. One is Aleph Taf, which means A to Z, Aleph to Taf. That's our job, to bring all the light from A to Z, from Aleph to Taf, from the upper walls, to He, which is Malchut, which is this physical world. That's our job. That's our job. We don't call, call the Creator you. When we say Ata, we mean it's a technology. What's the word before Ata in the blessing? Bauch. Bauch means blessed. But no, no, no. The Kabbalists are saying blessed. We are blessing God. No. When we say the word Baruch in any kind of blessing, Baruch, the Bet, stems from Bina. The Reish symbolizes Reshit Chokhmah, Chokhmah. The Vav is a sphere of that. And the Kaf is Sfirat Keter. So when we say Baruch, we open up the source of blessings in the universe, if we think about it. If we don't think about it, we just said Baruch, meaningless, empty, void. But when we say Baruch and we mean it, we open up the, the, the source of bliss to the world. And then we say Atta. Now we have to concentrate on drawing all the light of the upper worlds, A to Z, Aleph to Taf to the Hay, 
which is Malchut, which is this world. Hashem, Elokein, Melech Olam, it's like the blessing, which just every word pulls the light one level down. Okay? Now, why is this important and how is this connected? And now, continues the Zohar. Go'aleinu mo'olam o'shmecha, you are our redeemer, your name is forever. What is that? It's talking because, because the Goel, the redeemer, we're talking about the redeemer, we, and then we, the Zohar says, you never break, put a break between Ge'ula litfila. What is that? So you have to learn halacha for that. But we'll come to it. Okay? It means that when you pray the morning prayer and you reach the peak of the morning prayer in the prayer book, the Hebrew prayer book, you reach the blessing that says, Baruch Atah Hashem Goel Gaal Israel. Okay? Immediately after that, you say, uh, you, you start Filat Amida, the silent prayer, which starts Hashem Sfatai Tiftach. And you're not supposed to have any space between the two blessings, between Gaal Israel and Filat Amida. It has to be like in a rush, even one, one breath. So now Rav Ashlag is giving us what all of this, if you don't know Kabbalah, what I just said sounds like mumbo jumbo, a bunch of stuff. It's like, what does it has to do with my life? It says, Rabbi Ashlag adds, commentary on verse 9, whoever has the Zohar Sulam in English, and it says, because we have a problem. When it says, and Yehuda approached Joseph, and the word is even Vaigash, is even harsher expression because Vaigash comes from the Shoresh Nun Gimel Shin. Nun Gimel Shin means collision. When two cars collide, it's hit nagshut, right? So Veit Nagesh, Vaigash, it's like. So Yehuda, so you know, the commentators are saying that Yehuda is talking to Joseph. Like the whole world is dependent on it, which is the whole world is dependent on it. He has no idea what's going on. He knows that his world is coming to an end. If, if Benjamin stays a slave in Egypt, his life came to an end. He gave the guarantee in this world, in the upper world, to Jacob for that. It's like this is the end of the world for him. How could that? He, he can't see that. How would that happen? So when says Rabbi Ashlag. All the commentators say, Sheli Chorao Miyotar, the word Vaigash Yehuda, and Yehuda collided, approach Yosef. It's redundant. It's like we don't need that in order to understand the, the story. Hayam Astiklema, it was enough to say, Vayomer Elav Yehuda Biadoni. And Yehuda says to Yosef, to Joseph, my master, I have to talk to you. I have to tell you something. Rabbi Elazar, bringing all of this verse, is to open with that written verse from Isaiah. He wants to tell us that a human being is female. Every human being. Even the ones, as I said, who see themselves very masculine. Okay? They are also females. Why? You need the light of the Creator. You are a recipient. And if you think that you can live one single second without the light of the Creator, you have a problem. <laughs> you have a problem. It's like, how? It's not, it's not going. You can't live without the light of the Creator. Because, and that's why when we count the month according to the biblical law, we count it by, we count it by the moon. Because we are like the moon. The moon has no light of itself. Only what it returns from the sun. Same thing. We have no light of our own. Only the light we receive from the creator. And we reflect this light and give it to others. That's our light. And if you are not aware of it, you're in trouble. Why? The moment you think that this light is yours, you're in trouble. It's like you have no light of your own. 
no, I don't need the creator. You know, there's this famous uh, joke about this guy. He's very late to this appointment. It's very, very late. It's a crucial appointment. And it's like there's no parking spots. They say, God, please, if I found a parking spot, I will be doing this and this and this and this. I vow to give charity. I vow to do this. And it's like all of that stuff. Meanwhile, as he prays and he speaks about it, you know what happens? Somebody pulls over in front of him from a parking lot, and he has a parking lot. A miracle. You know what's the person's reaction? <clears throat> what's the person's reaction? Oh, God, it's okay. I, don't, I, I manage. I don't need anything. Which means, what do you mean you don't need anything? Of course you need. You need everything. And if you don't understand that you are female, that you are a vessel to receive the light, it's like there's no way. It's, you're not going to have the light. And you're going to go around saying, like, what's missing? Something is missing. What, what is missing? I'm empty. You're, not, you're empty if you know the same thing. You have this, like, you buy this electric machine. Okay? You try to operate it. It doesn't work. So there's a number you call, you know, customer service. Hello, customer service. I just got this machine of your company and so on and so on. I push the button, it doesn't work, whatever. What's the first thing they ask you? Uh, did you plug it into the electricity? <laughs> oh, I forgot. I didn't think about it. Okay, now plug it in and now push the on button. Oh, it's working. Thank you. Thank you so much. Which means the moment you're not aware that you are a vessel for the light of the creator, it means that you're not plugged in. You're not plugged in. So we go back when we say Baruch. The word Baruch is that, that every time you say Baruch, you're not saying thank you, God. You know what? He doesn't need your thanks. He's okay. Okay? He's the endless. What can you give him he doesn't have? And what can he take from you he doesn't have? Whatever you have, it's an extension of him. Okay, so you have to plug it in. And how do you plug it in? When you say Baruch, you plug it in. And then, but you need the whole cord. You need Atah, Hashem, Elokeinu, Melech, Haolam. Then you build the cord. Bore Priyagefet. Okay, now you create a device. Now it flows in. So, now that we understand that, says the Rabbi Ashlag as follows. Adam v'anukva a human being is female. He is the vessel. And our job as a vessel is, like any electric device, is to consume electricity. And when we talk about uh, human beings, we are here to consume light. Without the light of the Creator, we're nothing. We're just empty. Void. Dead. Now, when we understand that, now we can understand what the story is about. Uh, you know, because the story is that Yehuda, in the story of the Torah, Yehuda represents Malchut. Malchut is a code word to the vessel, female, the recipient. Yehuda represents the one who's the father of the tribe of Yehuda. He's a child. He represents mm -hmm. that what is called the vessel. He represents each one of us when we have a need, okay? Joseph, we learn in the previous parashot, he is a chariot. He represents what is called Sfirat Yesod. And what is Sfirat Yesod? Sfirat Yesod is the bottom part of the tree of life before it touches Malchut. It touches our world. So again, we are the recipients. We are Sfirat Malchut. We are in dire need for light every breath we have because without that, we don't live. Without that, we don't live. It's like any electric device, cut the cord, it's just a piece of junk. Without, without the plug, the cord to plug it in, it's a piece of junk. There's nothing. It's worth nothing. It just can stand in a corner or in the middle, can collect dust. Without that, we are also, if we are not aware that we need to connect to the light of the Creator, so there's nothing, nothing, it's empty. 
And we say like going around, well, what's missing? What's missing? Maybe something sweet, maybe something sour. Maybe I need some friends. Maybe I need some love. Oh, I need some love. You know, all of this, it doesn't work. Life doesn't work if you're not plugged in. You need to plug in. How do you plug in? You need to want it. You need to wish for it. And that's why, and especially when you are in a dire need and you realize that your world becomes dark, empty, void, nothing. And this is what Yehuda is about. He is there and his life is on the edge of total oblivion. If he's not coming back with, with uh, Binyamin, he's finished. He, pro he said to his father, I guarantee you, in this world and in the world to come, I, I, there's no life. I have no life if I'm not bringing Binyamin. And he re realized that this is his, right now, his interaction with Yosef is basically is to be or not to be. It's to be or not to be. Being means I am a vessel. I am means I'm a vessel. I am a vessel for the light of the Creator. The moment I'm not aware I'm a vessel, I'm not. I do not exist. Because, as we said in last parasha, the only purpose we are here in this world for is to draw that light to the world and sometimes the surrounding light, which means our calling. Let's say I think I'm supposed to be doing A, B, C. And, you know, logically, that's what I was trained for by my parents, by my, by my uh, environment, school, whatever, at work. I'm expecting what other people expect. And you know what? How many times this is just a limitation? We are not aware of what we're supposed to do. We don't know what's our calling. And then comes, as we said, the surrounding light. What is the surrounding light? This is the light of the Creator. They suppose it's surrounding me because it's, Suppose finally to come into me and fill me up. And as long as it's not filling me up, it's pushing. It's called pressure. This pressure creates the movies of trouble, trouble, and more troubles. Stress, stress, and more stress. It's coming from that surrounding light. So that surrounding light is the biggest culprit. Without him, we'll have nice, easy life. No, the surrounding light wants to come in, and when it comes in, and we do not expand the vessel, as we explained, it breaks the vessel. So when we feel the pressure, we feel the pain, what's the first thing to do to stop the pressure or to ease the pain? Think bigger. Enlarge. Think bigger. And what's the first thing to do to think bigger? To care for somebody else. What is Yehuda doing it over here? He's fighting for Binyamin. Well, really, he's fighting for his life. But he's fighting for Binyamin. And you know what he's doing? That's karma. He's fighting for Binyamin, the son of Rachel, that had another son, Joseph, that Yehuda is the one who gave the idea to sell Joseph to a slave. Why didn't you fight with such vigor then? Now you have to fight because you didn't do it in the previous round, now second round, third round, fourth round, till you do it right. It could take lifetimes till we finally do it right. And what do I mean do it right? It means expanding the vessel, which means to do. And in order to do something, you need to believe in yourself. You need to believe in the creation. You need to have certainty that there is some justice in the world. When I put the effort, there will be a reward. Which means this is the basics of modern society. Modern society says... Remember, you have to understand, along the years, people were educated that there is no fairness, which means idol worshipping was about, you know, 
I remind it again, read mythologies, the great mythologies of the big cultures, the Babylonian mythology, the Egyptian mythology, the Nordic mythology, the Greek and the Roman, the world was cruel. The fact that you are human, you're doomed. You're finished. What does it mean? Stay quiet. All of these mythologies serve a purpose of the ruling society. Now, we're talking about Athens in its glory, with all of its philosophers or whatever. Ah, democracy. Yeah, was it a democracy? There were maybe 200 free men and thousands of slaves. They worked. And the 200 men and women free, when men and women, they lived on the slave labor. So was it a democracy? What a fake. What a fake. Now, how do you control slaves and keep them low? How you control the lower class? Idol worshiping was the best invention. What mean? Don't expect fairness. The, the, the gods are mean. They are junkies of power, greed, money, whatever. And there's no justice. No justice. You can never change your destiny because you're a better person. You can never change yourself. Negativity is the name. And that's how you take away the most powerful asset of a human being. Hope you take away from them. And you know, Dark Ages religions, the religions that were created and ruled the world during the Dark Ages, were also based on the same thing. They're also telling you're born in sin, you are negative, whatever. God is great and you are nothing. Nothing. Life is nothing. And that was feudalism. The masses were owned by a small, small, little corrupt layer of people. Thank God the Dark Ages are over. Most areas around the world. And now humanism started. And what was humanism? It's basically taking the Bible. And there's no mistake that as one part of the Dark Ages being over is it that during the 16th, 17th century, the Bible, the Tanakh, was started to be translated into other languages. People were not allowed in Europe to read the Bible. It was in Latin. Who understood Latin? Who knew how to read? Nobody. It was that sentence if you translated the Bible into another language. Why? But the moment it was translated, people started to read and they started to realize that the Bible is about justice. It's about transformation. It's about hope. And that's the word of God. And the world started to change. And then people even started to get farther than that. But then, you know, some people went too far and they throw the baby with the water. They threw God out of the picture. And you know what? You can believe in hope, but without God, there's no hope because hope and God is the same thing. And we learned that in Hebrew, the word for, for hope is tikva. And the shoresh of the word tikva is kav, a line, a line to God aligned to the endless light of perfection, completion, fulfillment, and happiness. That every human deserves that. And basically, the war between the Greeks and the Maccabees that created Hanukkah was just about one idea, this idea exactly. The Greeks, their world was, as we just said, it was few land owners who controlled the big majority of the people that was just um, consumption, but consumption of what? Greed. Greed and using the masses. The Jews did not live like this. When the Greeks started to colonize Israel, the Jewish society was made of a big uh, middle class very small class of slaves and servants and very small class of very rich people. Most people 
where landowners, family landowners, farmers, nobody, nobody believed that somebody deserves to be too rich to rule, to rule everybody else. And when Hellenism is coming in and crawling in and starting to take away that right to have your own independence, which means to think and to own and to have the right for your property and for your life and the right for being happy. That was, that clash was too big. You know what? In the physical war, the Jews lost. In that round, they won. The Maccabees won. The Greeks were chosen, cho uh, chased out, chased out of the country. For a hundred years, there was independence, and the economy, middle class, grew up, learning. Everybody in the Jewish people, every we're talking about uh, second century BC. Every child, three years old, studied Hebrew, studied how to read and write and to start learning Torah and Mishnah and all of this stuff. Okay? That was democracy. But a hundred years later, the Romans took over. Now they were too big. Ten rebellions later, the Romans defeated the Jewish political entity. They even made a coin, Judea Capta, which means Judah has been captivated. And in the coin, they, you see a strong, masculine Roman soldier. And next to him, there's a palm tree that symbolized the great industry of Judea that made it rich. And then a woman sitting down crying. That's on the coin. And that woman is the captivated Judea, enslaved Judea. Somehow, 2,000 years later, things have been turned around. The world is slowly turning around. Thanks to what? Those Hanukkah candles that said, one little light can drive the darkness away. Just one light. If you just keep looking at that light, just visualizing that light, just imagining this light, you still have a line to the endless light. That's called tikva. Tikva means hope, but it means also having a line to the light. Now, but sometimes you have, sometimes, all the time, you have to fight for that line. And that's what Yehuda is doing. And that's why it says, Vaigash Yehuda, not any Yehuda said. Vaigash means collision. What do I mean collision? So the Zohar is explaining to us that when the light is coming from above, from the Creator, it's called male light in Aramaic, main duchin, male light, because bliss is coming from the Creator all the time. The problem is, if we take that light without working for it, it's high and by. It burns you. And there are many ways to get the light, you know. It's like, Taking without giving, making money without sharing. Uh, it's about alcohol, drugs, all of this stuff that make you high and then gives you a buy. That's drawing the light of the creator, which is mind duchin. In order for us to really create a lasting fulfillment in every aspect, health, economy, relationships, you need to create the opposite, main nukbin, female water. Now what happens to rainwater, which is like male water? It's coming from above. It drops, falls on the ground, then it flows on the ground. A lot of it is being uh, drawn in underground, and then it goes to the sea or to any kind of a whatever is a rock. But when the water that comes under the ground into the uh, Nature of Malchut. What is nature of Malchut? Receiving. Sucks it in. But sometimes the water in underground get to that special power and they go and they burst from below to above. Although water go from above to below, they go from below to 
above. There's a pressure that's coming out. That's called a spring. But you know, in many, many cultures, when you talk about youth, when you talk about rejuvenation, the spring is the symbol. Why? Because that's called female water. It's water that is coming from the bottom, the female side, and, and that's a symbol of reju rejuvenation. That's a symbol of divine light. That's why when somebody is looking for the secret of youth, it's called the fountain of youth. Why giving the image of, of the spring? Because it goes from below to above. The same thing, the tree of life. It grows from below to above. When a human being is young, he grows from below to above. Right? That's what it is. So, life is about growing from below to above. And that's what Yehuda is doing. He sees that everything is dire. Everything is negative. You have to go above your nature. And you have to collide and to go up and to do something for somebody else which is basically giving off everything, giving away everything for your principles. That was Hanukkah. Hanukkah was created from below. That's why it says when the Messiah comes, all the holidays are going to be nullified. Why? Because they're gifts. Rosh Hashanah is a gift. Pesach is a gift. It was given to us by the Creator. It's male water. Hanukkah was not a gift. Hanukkah was earned. Hanukkah was generated from below to above. And Yehuda is giving us this vaigash. You have to collide with the spiritual world, fight for your principles, fight for what's right. Because if you're not willing to fight for what you believe in, you don't have the right to preserve it and to be that person you really want to see yourself. When Yehuda fights for Benjamin, when he fights for his father, he has no idea he's risking his life. Because, you know, you go to a tyrant, old-fashioned, 4,000 years ago, you know, when a person gets so much power, and you know what's power? Power corrupts. And in cultures that a tyrant has absolute power, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the nicest people, you give them power, become crazy. Look at the lunatic from North Korea. The guy is crazy. Why is he crazy? Too much power. He has the ability to kill anyone. And you have a little amount of people running that country and they have 20 something millions of slaves. Can make anyone crazy. Give him the power, that absolute power to do anything with 20 something million people. No one can stay sane. You become insane. You then standing in front of somebody like this and he's giving everything he has. Why? He wants, that's the only way to connect to the light of the creator. And then what does it say? And then one of the most amazing verses in the whole Bible, in the whole Tanakh. And it says, uh, the verse is, Chapter 45, verse 1. Velo yachol Yosef leitapek lechol anitzavim alav. And Yosef cannot hold it anymore. Why? Remember, Yosef is representing Sfirat Yesod. When a person feels that something is blocked in every aspect of his life, it means Yesod is blocked. Blocked. The only way to open your sword, you have to hit it like a piñata. You hit the piñata, it opens up, and all the treasures fall on you. How do you hit the piñata? You have to ascend. You have to rise above everything. You have to believe. You have to fight for it. Like everything depends on it because everything depends on it. All the meaning of your life depends on it. And you have to do that. Judah is fighting for that. Yehuda is symbolizing each one of us. And Yosef is a symbol of Sfirat Yesod. The moment a person fights for his truth, for his life, for his spirituality, or to connect to the light of the Creator, it's 
of the creator. That's called really, uh, the word is Kiddush Hashem, which is translated into martyrdom. But there's something in, in it about, about sacrificing yourself. But again, sacrificing in Hebrew, Lakriv. Lakriv means in Hebrew, says the Zohar, to get closer. You're not really sacrificing, you're getting closer to Hashem, getting closer to the light. When you do that, the Yesod opens up, and then whatever, the light is coming in. And when the light comes in, you have no idea what's going to happen. When Yehuda was saying that what he said to Joseph, he thinks this is this crazy Egyptian tyrant. He just wants the light to come in. Did he figure out that that tyrant is going to become Joseph? That Benjamin is not going to be a slave anymore? They don't have to be hungry anymore? That the nightmare is over? The nightmare that he went through since he sold Joseph? He didn't think so. He just wanted to connect to the light. And the answer, when the light comes in, everything turns. Don't ever figure out to tell the light how to change your life. First of all, connect to the light. And when you connect to the light with that kind of, of giving yourself away, fighting for others, fighting for the good, you're ascending to somewhere, to a level that when you hit your sword, it opens up. And the bliss coming in. When you see yourself as that person that has to open the bliss to come through, when the bliss comes in, you have no idea what it's going to be like. You don't even, you can't even dream about it. You can't even figure it out. Because it's going to be beyond your dreams. Because your dreams can be only from the box because they're based on your logic. Even if you have a message from an, in your dream that is coming from outside the box, most people interpret it with the box. So when you really connect to the light without any cheshbonot, with any accountings, without any logic, the result will be from the other world. And that's why, you know, Rabbi Isaac Luria Darizal is saying, when a person is giving charity, when he's giving of himself with all the intensity beyond he can, when it's tough, when it's, he feels it breaks him down, you break, the, you collide with the soul and you break it into pieces. So then he says, it's like, imagine that everything in the soul, all the bliss is like sand that became coagulated into this like, stones, sandstone, because it was standing and the moisture gets it stuck. And when breaking it, when you do something out of your nature, those stones will break into sand and then the flow will start. And that's a message of this parasha. And that's a message of how you create miracles. Suddenly, Joseph is back. There's no problem with Benjamin. The cruel guy is your brother. It's like, well, you can't imagine something so Farfetch, it's like if you tell to somebody. But that's what this world is about. Don't, don't limit. Just connect to the light with passion, with love, with excitement. And what will come out will be beyond anything you can even imagine. Thank you. And Shavua Tov. Have a great month of Tevet. And, which is a hard work month. And also Hanukkah Sameach. Happy Hanukkah.